Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to GGS 300, so Quantitative Methods for Spatial Science. This is the 14th lecture, we're going to be focusing today on regression and for many of you you'll be glad to know that this is the last lecture of term, so we're almost at the summer recess. So what do we have left to do? Well there's going to be an assignment set today which will basically cover this, uh, this, this lecture so it will be on regression and then we just have the final exam for you to carry out so that's going to hopefully be completed by around about May the 9th, so I'll let you know when I know from the school uh, exactly when they need those final grade submissions, but obviously I will I will space it out so that you have as much time as possible to prepare from that, um, uh, but also I need to be able to turn those grades around to the school uh, within, within at least you know 24 to 48 hours of the final deadline, so I'll do my best to give you as much time uh, as possible for you to complete that and uh, towards the end of this session today I'm going to give you quite a bit of extra content just to give you an idea of what's going to come up in the final exam so there'll be just a brief recap on all of the things that we've covered this term, okay? Do reach out to me if you've got any further questions or if you need my help. I think that it's fairly uh, it's fairly straightforward now for you just to complete this, as I say, just to complete those final two steps. So I'm not going to spend too much time faffing about on these early slides because today we do, unfortunately, have quite a bit of material to go through. So I think we pretty much completed the flowchart now. Um, there's maybe only a couple of places we haven't touched, but today we're just kind of finishing off this last part, focusing more on relationships. But today going beyond kind of the correlation analysis that we did last week, which is kind of the basis for what we're doing today, but going on to more kind of sophisticated techniques. So whereas maybe we we're just looking at um, the variables, so two variables uh, and the degree to which they, they vary together based on some sort of association. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the ability to analyze multiple different variables and to do it in a more comprehensive framework so that you're able to have a bit more of an understanding not just about correlation but at least indicatively towards causation, okay? So a uh, quick recap before we begin, <laughs> uh, just so you know kind of where we're coming from and where we're going to uh, in this particular uh, lecture. Uh, so this is kind of the basis for statistics, okay? So we have some sort of outcome variable on the left-hand side here for which we collect data points for. And those data points that we collect, um, just you can think of them in terms of rows, so imagine that data being spread out on a spreadsheet or an R data frame, whatever. And then we have some sort of model here, so that's um, some sort of way that we expect a uh, certain um, uh, uh, variable to, to influence this, uh, this outcome here based on some sort of expectation about how the world works. And then we have an error term, okay, so um, we're trying to explain this outcome variable given this, uh, this factor that we have and then an, an, a degree to which it varies from that expected amount, okay. So, I mean, I'm not going to say this is all of statistics, but this is pretty much the basis of statistics. So if you can kind of come away understanding that this is how statisticians think of the world, uh, then you'll be in a really strong stead, you know, to actually uh, use what you've, what you've learned here and to go on and, and do fantastic things with the quantitative methods which you've picked up, okay. And I think this is going to be a common theme through today that um, really statisticians are looking for the simplest possible way to actually explain a large amount of, of data variation, okay? So we want the, the model with the least number of exploratory factors to provide us with the largest amount of explainability for a process that we want to analyze, okay? And I kind of brought this up when we were kind of when we were kicking off all of this um, with uh, the kind of introduction to statistics work in the first lecture, and I brought up Isaac Newton and Newton's very, very elegant, simple model of gravity, okay? So really the idea that we could comprehend the world in a very simple model and explain basically <laughs> everything uh, if we wanted to using this, this one framework for how objects move around and, and interact and have uh, certain forces of certain sizes, okay? So that's a very good example of how you can have uh, uh, a model which explains a large amount of the variance, so not 100% of the variance, but a large amount of it, uh, just down to you know size and distance, for example. So essentially what we, what we do when we get a test statistic is, is basically we have this numerator, which is the variance, which is explained by the model that we've developed. 
And then we basically have a denominator, which is the variance that our model unfortunately hasn't been able to explain. So we have effect over error, okay? And this is kind of a very simple way that we need to think about the test statistics, which we've been, uh, which we've been um, uh, using this term. So let's move on now into simple linear regression. And what I'm going to do is give you more of a kind of qualitative overview of this uh, at the beginning, and then we'll get into some more kind of formalized ways to understand bivariate regression and multiple regression as we move through uh, this lecture. So what's the form or nature of the relationship between a set of variables which we want to study, for example? Um, so, uh, it, like in correlation, we're measuring how one variable relates to each other. Generally, within this session today, at least for the first slides, I'm going to be focusing just on a single explanatory variable and then a single outcome variable. So it's the simplest possible type of regression that, that we could possibly run. And it's just two variables. And um, uh, we're, we're interested in, in, in the degree to which we have some sort of variation explained by one uh, in, the, in the other. So correlation versus regression. So correlation very much investigates the strength and the direction of the relationships between the two variables, whereas regression, so what we're moving on to now, focuses more on the functional relationship between the variables, okay? So both measure that degree of association between the variables, but correlation analysis is uh, focusing more on that strength and direction uh, between those two factors, whereas we're starting to get closer towards causal explanation using regression analysis. And I'm I'm saying that quite deliberately. <laughs> I'm saying kind of closer towards because we're definitely not getting to the stage where we can say A equals, you know, A leads to B. It's not direct causation that we can really prove. We still have some inherent limitations of this approach because it's still it's very, very much based on correlation analysis. But it provides us with many more tools to kind of explore these functional relationships. And that's because we can include many, many more variables and we can have, uh, for example, a theory about the way that the world works, that a set of explanatory factors leads to some outcome variable. And I'll, get, I'll give you concrete examples for this very shortly. And we're able to go off and we're able to measure and quantify that and use the information that we gather to feed back into the theory so that we have a better understanding of how to model that process in the future. Okay, So this is a really, really nice set of techniques that allow us to understand the degree to which different factors vary and may have an influence on certain outcome variables. So we still have to specify which uh, factors should be, for example, the, uh, the independent variables. So here we mean the explanatory variables when we say independent, and then the y variables, so that that's uh, the actual outcome variable, the dependent variable, so the thing that we're trying to measure the effect in. And I'll give you many more examples of this as we move through, but I'm kind of making the point here that we have to let theory kind of drive us and if we don't have theory then we you know we we have to recognize that the models that we may be making will have inherent uh, limitations mainly around you know correlation not causation so that's why we kind of always need to start with the theory that we already have for how we then start to build these these models so linear regression regression analysis explores quantitatively the relationships between the variables when one or multiple variables actually influence and affect another. Okay, fine. And we have to then specify those dependent, those independent variables. Okay, so this is what I said in the previous slide, but I've got some actual examples here for you now. And uh, why don't I start at the bottom of the list and then work my way up because I've got an example for you at the top. So we'll be able to, to work our way up to there. So imagine we had um, the land value as the predictor, as, as the y variable, so the outcome variable. And then we basically say that we want to try to understand the degree to which the distance from the city center and the quality of the neighborhood may, the quality of the neighborhood may influence that, okay? And then you could do that with uh, the altitude and the degree of rainfall, the, the amount of fertilizer that you use and the yield, and for example, uh, the amount of uh, education that you have and then the income that you could actually uh, uh, you actually earn through your life. OK, so generally we would expect that the more time you spend in education, the higher your income is going to be further through life. OK, so there's definitely variation in there. There's an error component, but uh, there'll be a trend that overall uh, is probably a positive correlation. So if you increase the number of education years that you have, the, the number of years you spend in education, then you're probably likely to also increase the amount of income which you, you make. OK, so I, I showed you at the beginning, we have this very simple 
simple kind of approach in statistics, which is where we have this outcome, and that's equal to some sort of model component uh, that, that we fit, and then an error term, okay? So we can think of that in this way as basically the income, so that's the outcome variable. Um, we can see that as the y variable. And then we can basically have a set of explanatory factors, which here we're just going to use one single one. So that's the number of education years that we place into the model. And then we have an error term associated with uh, this particular equation specification. OK, so think of the dependent variables as being dependent on the independent explanatory variables and the independent variables as explanatory variables. OK, so. Hopefully that's not too burdensome for you, and we're going to work through that in this uh, in this session now. And you've got uh, both the chapter, so it's chapter 17 this week that you need to read, and also the um, the actual laboratory session, which uh, hopefully you're going to do after this uh, this lecture. So we're hypothesizing that the dependent variable is influenced by the independent explanatory variables, which means that we can use those independent variables as predictors if we don't have the exact outcome data that we want. And this, this is why it's a really nice method. We can both have a set of outcome data and regress the impact of the explanatory variables, or we can flip that around and say, actually, we've got the, we've got the explanatory variables. Once we know the equation, how much do we think uh, we, that the value would be uh, for the outcome variable if we have a set of certain inputs. Okay, so uh, this gives us like a nice quantitative framework to do a variety of different things, either understand uh, a relationship that we already have based on some data, or if we don't have the data and we've got the equation, then we can just predict what we would expect it to take place. So, as I mentioned last time when I was talking about correlations, we always need to start by visualizing the data that we have using scatter plots. So, let's say we've got five different variables and uh, we want to, let's just say we're working on the income example, we want to understand the factors which influence income. And to do that, we're going to need to look at all the explanatory factors. So education will be one, and then there'll be a range of others. There'll be a personality type, for example, because um, that's going to affect how driven you are for, uh, in, certain, in certain areas. So, um, uh, you know, if you're more altruistic, then maybe you're less motivated by money, and that has an impact on, on your income expectations. Uh, whereas if you're more kind of competitive and assertive, then maybe you're more likely to kind of fit in a business environment, and that has an impact on your, your income earning potential, so that may be a factor. So anyway, you could have all of these different explanatory factors uh, leading to what you think may be income, and uh, what you need to do first is, you, before you even run a regression, you need to plot all of those different metrics against each other, and you can do that just one by one, or you can just build a scatter, a, a scatter panel, panel plot, basically. So what that does is that just has every single variable uh, in a plot plotted against every single other variable. And you can see the correlation for all of those different factors in one nice plot. Okay, So that just makes it relatively easy to understand what's going on here. So bivariate linear regression. I, I've kind of been I've kind of been qualitative in those previous descriptions, and now I'm going to start to move a little bit more quantitative as we move through this. So we still have another section where I'm going to try to describe more of it uh, and uh, bring in a couple of math equations. But then, really, as we move on to the next section, I'll give you the kind of more formalized math. Here, what we're trying to do is just to introduce you to uh, this beautiful set of techniques. Okay, so I think the key point is that. This is assuming that there's a linear relationship between the two variables that we're going to plot here. So let's just imagine it's income again, and we've got education as the explanatory factor. So maybe this y here is uh, income. So let's assume that this is uh, thousands of dollars uh, per year for your income. And then for the, uh, the x-axis here, let's just assume this is the number of years of education. So 10 may be basically everyone who uh, left after high school, uh, whereas 20 may be all the way up to people who did uh, advanced university degrees. And therefore, you would end up with something broadly looking like this. So we have this regression equation, which I'm sure by the end of this session you'll know uh, inside out, I hope. But basically, you have this y outcome variable, so that's this y variable here. And then you have this x explanatory variable, so on this x-axis here. And then we have a and b terms that we need to specify. So 
A is the intercept of the line, so that's where this line of best fit that we fitted through our data actually crosses the y-axis. And then um, B is essentially the slope, so it's, it's also called the regression coefficient or um, uh, the, the coefficient uh, of variation. Uh, so, so essentially, uh, this regression coefficient here indicates the slope of this line. Okay, so imagine if we increase this x-axis here by one unit, what that slope is going to tell us is uh, exactly how much uh, change we expect to take place on the y-axis. Okay, so if we increased on the x-axis here um, the unit by one, if it was a perfect correlation, a perfect positive correlation, there would be a one unit increase on the y-axis, okay? Um, and then if there was a, a negative perfect relationship for a one unit increase in x, we would end up with a, a minus one uh, unit increase in y, okay? So that's basically how we understand uh, th this uh, particular uh, component for this, uh, for this equation that we've got here. Okay, so don't fret. I will walk us through how we get these different uh, terms within the equation and then you'll be able to cement that when you get through into the actual laboratory session. So when we're using uh, least squares regression, so before I said it was bivariate, so that's just where we have two variables mapping together, okay? And when I say here least squares, what I mean is that uh, we, we need to estimate those A and B values. And this is just basically minimizing this difference between all of the data points to plot a line of best fit. OK, so um, uh, so I'll explain later what that means, but you'll understand why it's called least squares regression later, because we're minimizing the, the, squared, uh, the squared values. OK, so we're estimating the relationship between x and y when we obtain those a and b terms and this allows us to actually use this model as a predictive uh, tool in order to estimate y values given some x value okay so the best fitting line is the one that minimizes the sum of the squared vertical distances between each point and the line so i think that's fairly straightforward so what does that mean in practice OK, so we've got another example here of uh, our education years on the x-axis and our income on the y-axis. And we've got a set of lines that we've specified. OK, and what that means is that uh, we actually have managed to specify the regression equation here. So y equals a plus b of x. Um, so given um, so, so let's say, for example, we want to predict a value. So then given this equation, if we have an xi value, so a particular data point that we've collected. So let's just say that um, candidate A has 15 years worth of education. Well, once we know that equation, that basically means that we can put the 15 years into uh, the, the equation, work out where the intercept is, work out what the slope is, and we would end up with a line and it would basically end up helping us to predict uh, what the potential income would be for that one candidate that maybe we were interviewing uh, for some sort of purpose. Okay, so this is how we get the predicted y hat value so if it's got a hat like this uh, it's a, and it's a y hat, then that's uh, indicating that it's a predicted value. OK, so we will end up coming back to this uh, quite frequently, the fact that, that uh, we're denoting predicted values with this hat on. OK, so when we talk about least squares, as I mentioned before, and the fact that we're trying to minimize uh, the, 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 the squares that we actually obtained, uh, what we're doing is, is we're basically trying to minimize this quantity here. So um, uh, we basically have a predicted value which is subtracted from the actual uh, yi value and then we're, we're squaring it, okay? And we're getting the line of best fit as a result. So you can look at this within the actual book. I have an example here, so figure 14.2. And basically what we have is all of these different data points. So you see data point one, data point two, data point three, data point four, so on and so forth. And uh, what we're essentially doing is we're actually measuring uh, the distance to the, the line that we're going to uh, estimate. We're going to try and minimize all of the differences from the line for each one of these. And that's how we get our, uh, our predicted line of best fit. OK, so it's minimizing the, uh, the actual error that exists. Um, OK, so 
this would, you know, traditionally be quite hard to do. Thankfully, with computers, it's it's much easier these days. Um, but I don't know whether you did it when I was seven or eight, and I was just starting out having science classes. You know, they kind of teach you what a graph is, and uh, you know, they make you do an experiment, and then you have to plot the graph, and you're kind of writing it on graph paper yourself with a pencil, and you've plotted your different data points, and then basically you will make an estimate of the line of best fit, which <laughs> at that stage was obviously just kind of getting um, uh, getting a ruler and just kind of measuring, uh, just kind of roughly drawing the line of best fit uh, through the data points that you've got, uh, and obviously that's just kind of eyeballing it. Uh, whereas here, what we're able to do is use computers to basically minimize this quantity. Okay, so we're able to do, you know, thousands or millions of um, calculations per per second in order to uh, estimate what this should be thanks to semiconductors essentially so you know that's the muscle power that's the processing power that's driving your your computer your machinery okay so now we've got some terrible <laughs> horrifying equations for you here and don't worry too much because I'm not going to make you calculate these by hand here uh, so essentially this is just giving you an indication of how we calculate those a and b terms I think that these are from the book and they do it in a more laborious way than I'm going to do it so I wouldn't worry too much but basically we're able to get the a term which is the intercept so the point at which our, our, our line crosses the y-axis and then the b which is the better coefficient uh, so the, the slope so we're trying to estimate uh, how the line um, uh, actually um, uh, so, so what the slope of the actual line is okay so I don't want to bug you down with this too much. So as I state here, the book calculates these in a rather complex way. Um, so essentially we're going to do it in a, in a relatively uh, more easy way here, I think. So essentially what I've done is I've just worked out ways for us to basically obtain the A and the B through these two different equations. So hopefully that won't be too complicated for you. So first we need to get the intercept value over here, the A, and the way to do that is we just take the mean of y, okay, that's easy enough, and then subtract uh, the better coefficient multiplied by the mean of x, okay? So that's fine, relatively straightforward, and that's not complicated at all. We just need to go away and find the, the b value, okay? So the better coefficient. How do we get that, that coefficient? Well, the b is equal to, and you remember the Pearson r value, so that was our friend from last week, uh, the, the correlation coefficient. Pearson's correlation coefficient. Um, so we just obtain that R value, which you know how to do now, thanks to doing that laboratory work. And then we need to multiply it by the standard deviation of Y divided by the standard deviation of X, okay? And that should be um, a, a less intimidating way to kind of understand how to get these A and B terms, okay? So as I explained before, the intercept is basically the value of y when x is, uh, is zero, so it's the point at which we cross the y-axis. Whereas the, the better coefficient, the regression coefficient, the slope as you want to understand it, basically is indicative of the absolute change that we have in y given a one unit increase in, in x. Okay, so that's how we understand uh, the, the, the change in the slope within the graph. You remember I, I kind of plotted it out uh, relative to the curve. So we have a one unit increase across the axis on the x-axis. Um, for, for that one variable and then we would have some sort of change in the y-axis either positive or negative. So obviously if that better coefficient is over zero it's positive, that means it's a positive direction in the relationship, it's positive correlation and the vice versa would be that if it's negative so below zero then that would be a negative correlation okay and obviously if you were <laughs> If you just happen to get a zero or something relatively close to that, which sometimes does happen, then uh, that would be indicative of there being no correlation, so no relationship here, okay? Great, so I think I just wanted to emphasize the fact that now we have this kind of really beautiful equation, so we kind of expect that these independent variables or this independent variable that we have has some sort of influence over this outcome variable. So educational uh, uh, attainment, number of years of ed in education, leads to some sort of expected in, uh, outcome in terms of uh, income, so salary generated. Okay, and the point is that then if we have this kind of assumption that we're able to hold all the variables in the model constant, 
we're able to use this kind of quantitative framework to understand how changes in different variables may uh, lead to different potential outcomes. Okay, so here I spoke of just um, uh, just two variables, um, so one outcome and one predictor. But the likelihood is, you know, you may want uh, lots of different predictors if uh, if that's the model which best fits your data. And then as a result, you can kind of assume that, uh, that they stay the same. So in Latin, you may hear this as being ceteris paribus, which basically just means uh, holding uh, all variables constant or all things being constant. Uh, and it's kind of a workhorse of economics and a variety of other areas. But it means that you're able to kind of take this equation and do parameter sweeps of individual parts of this equation. So for individual uh, parameters that you've got, and then you're able to look at all the changes in the other factors okay so you can then plot that quite nicely on a graph and you can get some kind of understanding of, of how this relationship may change given uh, potential deviations in either the explanatory variables or uh, if you're thinking of it in the other direction um, uh, uh, you know how um, changes in some sort of uh, outcome variable may um, uh, how, how uh, so, so how, how much if there's a if you want this change in an outcome variable, how much your explanatory variables may need to move? Okay, great. So that was kind of the high level introduction to what we're doing. But then you know all the way through this course, I've given you a fairly standard way to understand each one of these tests so that you understand the requirements, the assumptions, the hypotheses, the test statistic that you're going to use. And this kind of fits in with the McGrew kind of breakout box, which they always have for all the different tests. So if you go into, if you go and look at uh, chapter 17 on simple linear regression, then somewhere, page 263, we have uh, that type of breakout box, which you should be familiar with now, which basically is kind of mimicked here. So what do we want to do with regression analysis if it's bivariate? Well, that's to determine if x accounts for a significant proportion in the variation and y. There are a set of requirements, okay? So these assumptions I've been through many times before and I've raised them as issues with you and we've encountered things such as spatial autocorrelation, for example. In this particular case, like most of our inferential tests, in fact, we have to have uh, randomly collected data, randomly sampled data. And in this case, as we have two different variables that we're going to use, we would expect to have two random samples, one for each of them. Much like in the correlation work, which we did last week, we would expect there to be a, a linear relationship between X and Y. And now I'm going to give you three different uh, requirements that we're going to pick up later in this session today. OK, so I'm just going to give you them now and I'll give you more explanations to what they are later. But we basically need to have normally distributed uh, residual errors. OK, so I'll cover what this means later. We need to have an equal variance among those residual areas, errors. And we need to have independence among those different residuals. Okay, So these three I'll come back to and I'll give you graphical examples of exactly what we mean there. And then finally, just to close off, this is uh, kind of expectant that we have, it's expectant that we have uh, ratio or interval observations. OK, so continuous data. So I don't think that uh, the first two and the last one are anything new. That's quite similar to a lot of the other tests that we've covered. The only difference is that regression has these three requirements here, these three new assumptions, which uh, I'll pick up in due course. So we have a set of hypotheses. So for um, the, this uh, row squared value here, this is actually uh, the population coefficient of determination. OK, and the way that we uh, obtain this, well, the best representation for that population coefficient of determination, if we don't have it for the full population, which, you know, we almost never do, <laughs> is uh, we, we basically need to use the sample coefficient of determination. So don't worry about the fact that I'm calling it the coefficient of determination. I'll, I'll show uh, what that means later, but it's basically the, the R squared value, OK? So anyway, the point of the hypothesis here is that to get this R, so it's for the null hypothesis, what we're hypothesizing is that this row squared value uh, is equal to zero. OK, so this basically means that uh, we don't uh, we assume that there's no um, relationship 
um, that, that, that's present between these two different variables. Okay, so it's quite similar to the way that we approached the correlation work that we did last week. For the alternative hypothesis, obviously here what we're saying is that uh, we expect uh, the coefficient of determination to be significantly different from zero, okay? And we're not saying whether it's higher or lower in this instance, we're just saying that we expect it to be significantly different from zero, so it's bidirectional, um, and we need to take that into account. For this particular test, we're looking for a test statistic which uh, is, is focused on F, so we're basically using ANOVA as a way to, to make this assessment which means that we need to get this uh, this F test statistic here, okay? Uh, so what we need to do in order to get that is we need to take the sample coefficient of determination, which is the uh, the, the coefficient uh, the coefficient value, the correlation value squared, multiplied by uh, n minus 2, so the number of degrees of freedom to get this numerator. And then as the denominator here, so just beneath uh, this uh, this equation, we need uh, the 1 minus r squared uh, value, and then that should help us produce this f statistic here. But the issue is that we need to get the r squared, so in order to do that we need to take the sum of the explained variation here, and we need to actually divide it by the sum of all variation that we have. Okay, so this is uh, how we get those tests in order to use this inferentially don't worry too much that this is kind of a lot of content. We'll go over that in uh, hopefully some easy digestible steps later so that you kind of know what's going on. So don't feel too intimidated uh, at this stage. I will give you all of this information and we'll run through it. And then hopefully by the time it comes to you doing the assignment this week and also uh, you actually uh, carrying out the midterm exam, uh, it shouldn't be uh, <laughs> too intimidating for you. So we're just going back to that uh, kind of model that we always have within statistics. Okay, so we have some expected model and the data that we have, so this outcome, we have some sort of fit plus some residual amount for the data. Okay, so what we're doing is we're putting in uh, the explanatory variable here where we have fit and we're assessing how well that data variable leads to some sort of fit and where we have deviation from that, it ends up in the residual in order to try and understand how much influence it has on this outcome. Okay, so we can think of this in terms of the total variation in the data of the y term equals the explained amount of variation plus the unexplained variation, okay? So this is basically the total variation TSS equals the RSS plus the ESS. So the TSS here stands for the total sum of squares, so the total variation in Y. Um, the RSS stands for the regression sum of squares or explained sum of squares. So this is how much your model is actually explaining at this point in time with the data that you've got. And then you have that error term, that residual amount, so the ESS, so that's the error uh, sum of squares or the residual sum of squares or the unexplained sum of squares. Okay, and we can you can actually get these relatively straightforwardly. So to get the TSS, the total sum of squares, you're subtracting the, uh, the mean of the, the Y variable from each one of those Y data points, squaring it, and you're getting the sum. You can get the regression sum of squares by basically subtracting the mean of y from your predicted value, okay, and that gives you how much you've explained in your model. Or to get the error term, what you can do is you can subtract the predicted y value, so the y hat here, uh, from each one of the y uh, 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 data points that you have, uh, and then you can uh, square them and sum them, okay. So you'll just notice here we had the, the y bar. So that's uh, the mean of y. We then here we had the, the, the mean bar, so the, the y bar, so the mean of this variable subtracted from the y hat, so the predicted value. And down here we had the y hat, so the predicted value subtracted from each one of the y data points. Okay, so that's how we get these three different terms. Um, and don't worry, it's it's fairly straightforward when you think about it and kind of break it down into uh, this way that I've kind of put it up here. So you have total variation in data, your TSS, you then have the explained amount uh, plus the unexplained amount. Okay, and you can read the book and the book actually has this kind of metaphor where it's explaining about how you 
uh, may want to kind of interpret this. So it says there's like a bucket of water and that bucket has uh, a sponge in and you're trying to understand, it kind of breaks it down into the, the amount of explained variance or unexplained variance. So anyway, you can read that if you need another um, kind of more introductory metaphor to understand how to understand this model. So fitting part of the variation. So um, I explained before that, that that's the part that uh, basically explains how much uh, is actually varying. So it's called the explained variation. It's the amount of variation that can be accounted for by the independent variable x. So it gives you some indication of the strength of the model and the ability for x to account for the variation in y. OK, great. The residual part is the unexplained variation. OK, so it's saying how much the existing model that we have uh, doesn't explain. Uh, and often, you know, this is this is really the, the crux of this kind of approach. You want to minimize this part uh, without creating too much of a burdensome model. OK, so you want to add enough predictors to get decent explainability, but you don't want to just keep adding lots and lots and lots of predictors because uh, basically you, you'll get penalised for that. It's, it's not a simple model, uh, and uh, you know there's, you, you introduce all sorts of errors if you just have more variables because, uh, as I'll explain later, you can get all sorts of uh, multicollinearity issue issues. So this is where you have correlating variables which correlate with each other and therefore aren't very good at being predictive. OK, so the residuals that we get are basically just the observed response uh, minus the predicted response. OK, so I think that's pretty clear. We did, we did cover it down here. So subtracting that y hat from the observed y values. OK, and we do have this assumption uh, that we expect these residuals to be normally distributed and therefore have a mean of 0. OK. So let's move on to this r squared value, which we covered previously uh, in the equations, but which we didn't go into too much detail as to how we actually obtain that. So this is the coefficient of determination. So it's a measure of the strength of the regression relationship. It's not tied to any measurement unit, so it's usually a value between 0 and 1 is indicative of uh, the percentage uh, of, 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 the, of explanation that your model actually provides okay, with the data that you actually have. Okay. So uh, r squared here is between 0 and 1. Uh, r, an r squared of 1 is a perfect fit, and an r squared of 0 is that there's no relation at all between the two variables. Okay, So you can obtain this r squared by taking the RSS divided by the TSS. Uh, and um, you can obtain that in, in this particular way. Oh, and I just published a recent paper <laughs> yesterday, in fact. It just came out, so I just wanted to introduce it to you here because we use these techniques within uh, th this paper, and therefore I just wanted you to kind of take a look at what you could do. So uh, this is basically trying to predict uh, cell phone adoption metrics from satellite imagery. So uh, if you are the government of Ethiopia or the, or the government of Malawi, you might not have decent uh, local data on who actually has cell phones and who doesn't. And obviously there's lots of economic development benefits from having access to the internet or even just having a basic 2G signal. So uh, what we tried to do was to actually develop a, a machine learning based approach which allows us to predict um, uh, how many people may be connected to uh, the cellular network just by showing uh, the actual uh, machine learning algorithm, just a standard satellite image. So basically the, uh, the, the machine learning approach that we used actually just learns entirely for itself. And we use a set of survey data to actually train this. And basically what the model's picking up is the fact that if you're wealthy, then you're probably going to be living in an environment where maybe your roof has um, tiles uh, and your building is square. And that means that you probably have a cell phone and you can probably pay for the service reasonably well. And then in the middle, you've probably got people who might live in um, a building with corrugated uh, iron uh, as, as the roof and you might not have any roads near there. And that, that maybe therefore you, you can only afford a very, very basic cell phone service. And then that goes all the way down to maybe the bottom end of our distribution here. Maybe people live in round houses and there's organic material for the roof. And uh, therefore you can't, maybe you can't afford a cell phone, unfortunately, because you're a subsistence farmer. And really our model's picking this up, but we actually use these, uh, the Pearson R squared value 
to evaluate the amount of predictability that our model produces, okay? So we've just got a picture of Malawi here. The code's all available online if you're interested, but I would suggest you download this paper and have a look at the way that we use these Pearson R squared values, okay? So we basically loaded in a whole load of survey data that we've got that have uh, latitude, longitude survey locations. We then kind of download a whole load of satellite imagery from Planet. So Planet's a company which launches satellites and develops satellite imagery. And then we just train a neural network, a convolutional neural network. So this is a machine learning model which says, uh, under these circumstances, this type of image uh, produces this type of result, and the model's able to kind of learn that pattern uh, from the image. And then we're able to basically uh, apply that to a bunch of new data and actually uh, evaluate its uh, predictability there. And then we can actually scale that across a whole country. So we can go to a government and say, we are able to make estimates of the on-the-ground conditions in these locations where maybe you haven't had the money to actually do census surveys uh, because it's just too expensive. Normally, census surveys only cover individual points like a local community, whereas we want to kind of generalize that data to a whole country, a very uh, large area. So anyway, you can take a look at this. We have uh, different um, uh, estimates, and you can see the R squared value here. So the uh, degree of explainability in our model. So only about 40% of the variations being explained in our model, which, you know, actually that is quite good. I mean, it's, it, okay, it's not amazing, but um, uh, it's a big improvement over the existing methods, which maybe only predict about 20%, for example. And um, so there's a lot of variation there, um, but it was just a nice technique for us to be able to, to demonstrate. So I'll send you the link and you can take a look at how we've used that within this particular approach. So we use ridge regressions in those uh, in the, the in the paper to evaluate uh, the effectiveness. Now I'm just going to run through kind of some basic regression outputs that you might get. So here we have uh, a regression output from R that we will go over within the uh, within the laboratory session. So we have a set of residuals and we're basically able to understand how the residuals are varying here. So remember we want normally distributed uh, residuals. So when we look at this. Um, set of quantiles, we want to see that the median is broadly close to zero, okay? Remember that's indicative of us having reasonably normally uh, distributed data. Uh, we're going to have a set of coefficients, so this is x1 here is the uh, the, the uh, explain, uh, so it's the independent variable, and then we're basically regressing here against the the, the y variable, okay? And we're going to get uh, an estimate uh, for this particular uh, better coefficient, uh, so this is um, the, the, the slope here. We're going to get a standard error estimate and then we're going to get t-value as well and then we're going to get a probability for this particular metric so what this is indicating here with these three dots is that we have a highly significant uh, variable here uh, generally if, if your actual um, uh, value here is twice the size of the standard error then you're going to get a significant result uh, but this is basically saying that this particular regression that we've gone, done uh, um, is uh, that there is an effect which we're able to measure and that they are correlated with each other and that uh, the model is actually producing a, a reasonable degree of explainability. Okay, So um, we actually have other uh, explanatory variables down here. So we have the residual standard error um, and then we have the the multiple uh, R squared value. So this is just the general amount of uh, explainability of our model, which was about 54%. And then we have this adjusted R squared value here, which is just basically a way to take into account the fact that as we add more variables into our model, we will get more explainability, but therefore we need to kind of penalize it because uh, we don't want to have lots of uh, variables in our model. Okay, so uh, this uh, stops the R squared becoming inflated just because we've added in more variables, even if they're not actually any help in providing a greater explanation. And then we get an F statistic for the model that we fitted, which is very large, and we get a p-value, which is highly significant. So generally, this is indicative of the fact that the, the x variable is related to the, the, the y variable here, uh, and the model uh, is providing a reasonable degree of explainability as, as a result. Okay, so you can have a look through uh, the way that I've explained this here. I think I, I did that reasonably uh, quickly. Uh, so the, the coefficients estimate uh, the value of a and b, fine, uh, with their, each of their own standard error, and you can use that to do a t-test. 
Um, and then uh, we've got the p-values, the probability of that t, and that's basically saying how significant the, the coefficient is. Fine, and um, significance is indicative of the coefficient uh, being valid in the regression. Yeah, so we've already said that. And uh, okay, the intercept significance doesn't really matter that much. Residuals generally, our assumption is that they're normally distributed, so we'd expect a, a residual value of something close to zero for the mean. Sorry, residual mean is something close to a zero. Uh, and uh, then we have a set of model diagnostics. Okay, so we do need to run through each of these. I've given you a high level overview. I'm not going to go through each of them again, but uh, we will pick them up when we get through to the laboratory session. I, I appreciate this is information overload. So hopefully by the time we've broken this down and we've gone through this, uh, in the next you know, 20 minutes to finish off this lecture and then we get into the lab, it will hopefully become a bit clearer to you. You've obviously got the book to pick up on any areas of uh, clarification which you need. So residual analysis. You know, I've spoken about residuals now <laughs> multiple times and the assumptions for the models, so what exactly are they? Well, this is the amount of deviation that we get from the regression line, okay? So um, basically, uh, so let's say we make a prediction of where a residual is that we think it is, but actually, we have a real value for where that uh, for the, for that um, uh, y value is, and then the difference between the predicted and the actual observed value is the residual value. Okay, so here we have distance uh, from a lake, and we have snowfall, and we have some expectation after fitting uh, a line of best fit. But if you're further away from uh, a lake, then you would have lower snowfall, and if you were closer to a lake, you would have higher snowfall. Because water has a high heat capacity, water will absorb that heat and that will lower the temperature and then you're more likely to have snow. Okay, So the residuals, as I said before, can be obtained by subtracting that y hat, the predicted value, from the y uh, data point that you have, so the actual value of the dependent variable. Those assumptions that we mentioned before for the residuals, so we expect them to be linear, so um, we, we don't want to see any violations with regards to the residuals doing funky things like S-shapes <laughs> uh, because then obviously that the, they are not linear. Uh, we don't want to see residuals that are correlated in some way, so we need to expect them to be independent. So this is coming back to the issues of using regression analysis on spatial data because of spatial autocorrelation. It means that they're not always, uh, if you have sp a spatial autocorrelation present, then they're not always independent, and that means that you're violating this assumption, your residuals uh, will be dependent and uh, there'll be something else uh, driving this. So you can't use a standard regression approach if, if that's the case. We would expect constant variance of the residuals, so we don't want to see farming out of the, re the residuals over time because that's indicative of, of something else that's going on. And we would expect these residuals to be normally distributed. Okay, so we can derive that by looking at a QQ plot. Okay, so I'll show you what this means shortly. This is just a quantile quantile plot. Okay, so violation of assumption one in our regression approach, non-linearity. So we're plotting residuals against fitted Y values. So this is the type of regression um, uh, outcome that you might get which is fairly standard and for which you, you can't really easily tell that this is going on until you actually plot uh, those standardized residuals. Okay, So these are standardized in terms of uh, their differences from the predicted value, and then these are the actual fitted values. And you can see we actually have a U-shaped curve here. So uh, this is indicative of the fact that we are breaching this linearity assumption here because the residuals really aren't uh, linearly distributed. So this is a warning sign for not meeting the requirements of the test. Number two, violation assumption, so non-independence of the residuals. So again, we're plotting here the residuals against time. So we've got the standardized residuals. So this is the amount of difference uh, between the predicted value and the value observed. And then we have time on the x-axis here. And we can see that over time, our uh, residuals are actually increasing. So they started negatively here and they ended up in positive territory over this time period uh, which is indicative of uh, something else driving uh, the particular um, uh, 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 the particular process that we're trying to understand um, and therefore we're not able to kind of assume stationarity uh, in the residuals and therefore this is kind of a, a warning sign that you're not meeting the required assumptions. Violation three 
um, non-constant variance. So um, as ever in statistics, <laughs> we have some really horrible terms for, for you guys to learn in order to understand what constant variance is or non-constant variance is. So the way to remember this is that when we refer to this word here, scedasticity, we're referring to variance, okay? And what we would like to assume is uh, homoscedasticity, so that basically means that uh, you have uh, the same level of variation uh, in the data point. So um, uh, the way to remember this for homoscedasticity versus heteroscedasticity is if you were going out and you're going to do a census survey and you're asking people sexual preference, um, the majority of people probably fall into those two different categories, uh, so uh, heterosexual or homosexual, and essentially you there have uh, you know the scientific terms which homo means the same within science and hetero means obviously different within science. Um, sorry, I haven't checked the etymology on that, but I'm guessing that if you go back to Greek or Latin, then this is probably where these terms come from. So, so my point here is that we can kind of break it down. So we have homoscedasticity, so constant variance, or in this case, based on the actual plots that we've got down here, uh, heteroscedasticity. So, okay, so heteroscedastic is the, the problem that we have with these data points, and that's because the variance isn't constant. Okay, So we have the standardized residuals on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis, we have the fitted values. Uh, and basically what we have is a fanning out of these residuals as we, we cross uh, uh, through uh, the, 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 the line that we have, okay, that we plotted. So the issue is that we don't meet this standard assumption, uh, which means that uh, you know, we violated the, the regression requirements. But make sure that you learn these. They might be in the tests, okay? Violation of assumption four, non-normal residuals. So uh, we need to basically carry out a quantile plot, a QQ plot, uh, in which basically is able to compare the sample quantiles, okay, with the theoretical quantiles. And really we're looking for a straight line. And here we don't have that. We have quite a significant deviation from that straight line based on the quantiles that we've obtained in the residuals and the theoretical quantiles. So if it was normally distributed, this is kind of how we would expect uh, those quantiles to, to pan out. So um, significant deviations from the one one line. So that means one change in the x-axis leads to a one change, one unit change in the y-axis. And when we have this, it implies a lack of normality, okay? So uh, you can inferentially test this for normality using Shapiro-Wilkes or Kolmogorov-Shmirnov, the Kolmogorov-Shmirnov test. Um, but essentially, this is what we're really looking for, normally distributed data where our residuals in the QQ plot track that line. Um, and then what we might have in reality is something where we have uh, these data points being skewed to the left or skewed to the right, or thick tails or thin tails, okay? So we don't want to see lots of wiggling around this line because it's indicative of the fact that we are not meeting that assumption for the standard regression approach. So I've shown you bad regressions. <laughs> Let me show you what you're really looking for in terms of good regressions. So if we're actually plotting the residuals over time here, so we've got the standardized residuals on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, over time, there's no... Um, kind of trend in the changes of these residuals. So these are all kind of nicely randomly distributed across this, this plotting space here. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, this is really what we're kind of looking for uh, to ensure that um, we're not kind of breaching some sort of um, temporal variance, that they're not correlated in some way, we've got d independent residuals. So, sorry, I should have shown you this plot first because this is actually the scatter plot for the good regression. So imagine that on this x-axis here, let's just think of it in terms of education years, and the y-axis here is, let's just think of this as um, uh, dollars income per day. And essentially, uh, what we end up having is uh, quite a positive correlation between these two variables. So if you stay in education longer, you end up getting a higher uh, income uh, on the whole. And uh, that produces these nice residuals, which we, we mentioned previously. And al also, if we then look at the fitted values versus the standardized residuals, these are all nicely randomly distributed residuals here. And then when we actually plot the quantiles, 
so the sample quantiles that we've got versus the uh, theoretical quantiles, okay? Uh, we're actually quite nicely tracking uh, this straight line of only a little bit of deviation. So this is uh, indicative of the fact that we are, we're meeting that assumption about normally distributed residuals, okay? So let's just go into standardized residuals a little bit more now uh, because I appreciate we just kind of went through all of those different uh, graphs without going into too much detail about them. But essentially these standardized residuals enable you to make comparisons between different regressions. So you can divide each residual by the regression standard error in order to get this, this normalized uh, standardized residual. So the rule of thumb is that you've got an outlier if your standardized residual is uh, uh, below minus two or over plus two uh, in terms of its position relative to the rest of the, the data points. And the standard error of the regression, so the residual standard error, is basically uh, an index that's representing the typical distance separating a point from the regression line. Okay, So uh, this is thinking about the, the level of deviation that we have from that, uh, th that line which we fitted using least squares. So we've got the standard error here. We need to take the square root of the sum of uh, the, the residual value. So this is the... Um, the predicted y hat value subtracted from each y i value here squared and then divided by the number of degrees of freedom because we've got two variables uh, so it's n minus two so that gives us the error sum of squares here okay so multivariate regression so this is where we can basically have more than one independent variable to explain why so uh, actually i think that this is probably most likely uh, the technique that you would use if you were going to go off and apply a regression okay so uh, let's give you an example plant growth as a function of the light intensity the length of time that it's been out uh, and let's say also the temperature um, so basically the plant growth variable outcome uh, the outcome variable is is the y which we have here within this equation. We then have uh, the intercept value A, and then we have these multiple um, slopes which relate to uh, the different coefficients that we have, so the, the explanatory variables x1 and, and, and x2. With two independent variables, you can think of regression as the plane of best fit. Yeah, so I don't want to get you too bogged down into this because thankfully most of the, well, the software does all the hard work for us when we're fitting uh, lots of different uh, independent variables into a multiple, into a multivariate regression. So we can still use ordinary least squares, OLS, if the relationship uh, is uh, assumed to be linear. You can do more sophisticated things, but I'm not getting into it here, okay? So in my PhD, one of the issues was that if you have very large data sets, you know, if you've got two million data points, the computer's not going to be able to optimize uh, the, the minimal line of best fit across all of those data points. So you can actually use a Bayesian approach. So this is just uh, a different type of statistical approach. So everything we've covered this term is classical frequentist statistics, whereas a Bayesian approach takes a uh, uh, a very different view of the world. It's kind of growing in popularity and uh, it's more complex, so I'm not going to be getting into it too much in this course. But I just wanted to make you aware of it, that, that that's something which you uh, you can uh, reach out into if you feel like you want to uh, do more advanced techniques. So uh, it's still regression, um, so you need a logical reason why you're in choosing, why you're including predictors. Yeah, fine. So I mentioned earlier that we need theory to start off with. OK, so theory is going to drive why we choose a set of variables and why we think it's going to predict and explain this one outcome variable that we're modeling. We can compare the coefficients. So bigger coefficients are not necessarily better. Coefficients uh, are usually uh, coefficients are scaled. Um, they have units, but they're in absolute measures. Um, so um, we must standardize them by dividing the estimate by a standard error. OK, coefficient validity. So this is just basically um, uh, uh, <laughs> if a coefficient fails its t-test, it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to leave the regression. Yeah, I mean, this is where we start to get into these issues of statistics kind of being a bit of an art in places because we have these beautiful formalized statistical tests that we're applying here, but we have this, you know, upfront theory and the decisions that need to be made around which factors we're going to place into the model. And that's why I'm kind of describing it as a, 
actually kind of an art of statistics rather than hard formalized science in terms of how we input those factors into, into the model. So multivariate, that just means, you know, rather than bivariate, so two variables, multivariate just means we have more than two um, uh, variables, okay, um, and in introduces these issues which we need to be very much aware of. So multicollinearity is an issue which uh, can plague you if you just keep adding in lots of different predictors. It basically means that you have strong correlations between your independent variables, and it's a real problem in the work that we do. Um, so, you know, as I explained here, it hurts the regression. The model can't assign which part of the variance goes to each independent variable. Um, uh, and therefore, this is a, a serious issue. So if I told you that I wanted to measure, you know, wealth or unemployment, and then basically we would just start to put in things like population density and uh, education level and all of these different variables, the, the population density and uh, education, and I suspect also uh, income, will all be quite multi um, variate, multi uh, co multi correlated. So there will be uh, lots of issues if you were to try and run regressions there that you need to kind of make sure that you're not putting in highly correlated variables. So um, I'm not going to go into too much detail of it here, but you basically need to uh, look at all the correlations between your different input uh, variables. So you need to run a correlation matrix and try to make sure that you're not putting in things which are more than, you know, 50% correlated with each other. Otherwise, you're going to introduce certain issues into the analysis that you're doing. Overfitting. So this happens regularly. So no matter if a new independent variable is related to the dependence or not, the R squared will increase um, because you've uh, you, you've overfitted. Um, so basically, putting too many variables into the model introduces uh, additional noise, and that's why we're interested in taking the adjusted R squared value, which I mentioned previously, rather than just using this kind of blunt R squared value, which doesn't take into account how many variables you've added into the model. I mean, as I explained earlier, we want the least number of predictors um, to explain the largest amount of variance in our model. That's kind of the basis for statistics, okay? So just to give you an indication of, of kind of how this changes, so let's see what happens if we try to, as we try to see what happens with the dependent variable uh, and how it's predicted by adding lots of independent variables. So uh, here what we have is um, uh, tax band. So let's see how um, the income per capita and then the median age being added in actually starts to change these. So here we have one variable added, here we have uh, two variables, here we have three variables, so we have uh, the, the tax, uh, and then we have population, I think that's the income per capita, median age, population density. So essentially what's happening each time we add it is we get uh, an R-squared value of about 30% uh, explanation, ex explain, about 30% um, uh, sorry, the variance in the model that we've just predicted here uh, explains about 30% uh, of, of, of the in the underlying data. So the point is that as we add in more variables, so here we have one, we get a 30% explanation with the R squared. Here we add in two, we get a 40%. Here we add in three, but we get a very small additional amount of variation, okay? And then if we look at what the R squared is doing each time, so here we have 28% um, um, of explainability in this data thanks to this model. Here we have 37% with the adjusted R squared explainability in this model. And here we actually have a decrease even though we've added uh, a, a new variable in and that's because they're obviously getting penalized for the number of variables that you add in when you're using the adjusted R squared to prevent this overfitting um, and uh, you get a decrease, okay? And then you get something relatively similar happen happening up here as we start to add in loads more variables. I think the key point as well is when we've added in all of these different variables here, uh, just because we've got more variables doesn't mean that we've got a higher explanation overall, okay? And we're getting higher explanation at times with fewer variables. So it's it's important to, to recognize how this is going to affect our model. It's worth looking at those regression papers where maybe they're presenting a panel of like five different models and they're maybe starting with just a couple of explanatory variables and then maybe they'll stick them all in. Uh, in the last one, you have a set of different regression diagnostics and it gives you an indication of how the model's varying. 
based on those different factors that you're placing into uh, the, the equation. Okay, so look, this was a long session. I appreciate it, and there was a lot of material. It's kind of been the, you know, it's the, the culmination of all of the work that we've done this term to kind of uh, finish at this point where we're doing regression analysis. I just want to quickly go over course review and give you some indication of you know what to expect for the exam and give you a, a bit of an overview of the material that we've covered this term. So I will try to confirm with you as soon as possible the actual final exam date. I don't know what that is yet because I'm recording this lecture a bit ahead of time so that for those of you who want to progress with all the course materials, which I know many of you want to, ahead of your exams, exams you know, you've got more time to do this. So I'm trying to give you uh, as much opportunity and flexibility in completing this course as possible. So the final exam, it will be approximately, you know, two hours. Um, it will be cumulative. So uh, it's going to focus on all of the things that we've learned this term, but it will have quite a bit of content in from the last three parts. So a categorical difference test, correlation, spatial influence, regression. Um, some of this is technically open to change, so I need, still need to check the actual uh, length of the exam here. But generally, this is going to give you a bit of an overview of, of what I have planned for now. So what have we actually done within this course? So we've covered you know, everything from data terminology about how you understand data uh, through to um, you know, actually looking at the descriptive statistics. So this is kind of basic, basic statistical understanding. So really not taxing at that early stage of the course. Then we kind of got into more complex areas. So actually looking at probability, which obviously underpins all of the future work that we've done. Um, understanding probability distributions, so how we can use those to our advantage. Sampling and estimation, in case you need to go off and actually sample in the future, collect your own data. Formally test hypotheses and actually carry out inferential statistics. So we had these issues around geographic data. So they were predominantly that we have issues like boundary delimi delimi delineation. Uh, we have the modifiable aerial unit problem. Uh, we have uh, spatial aggregation scale issues, ecological fallacy issues. And we have all sorts of different uh, types of data that we can collect. So from nominal through to ratio. In the descriptive statistics part, we covered issues uh, relating to central tendency, dispersion and shape, um, and then relative and absolute measures of, uh, of dispersion. Within probability, we focused on both kind of discrete versus continuous, and then within the discrete distributions that we covered, we covered binomial and Poisson, and then uh, within continuous distributions, we focused on the normal distribution, then actually understanding z-scores and how they relate to kind of probability outcomes, okay? Sampling and estimation, we covered a variety of sampling methods. We covered the importance of the central limit theorem. So this is kind of the basis for how we are able to obtain small samples based on a set of assumptions about how we sample those data points and then how we're able to generalize those parameters that we produce to a whole population without having carried out a full census. We looked at confidence intervals, which if you go on and you do further research is going to be essential because if you want to publish a paper, you need to have uh, the confidence intervals presented around any estimates that you make for the process that you're, you're studying. We tested hypotheses in a very basic way. So that covered those kind of six steps about stating the hypothesis and then uh, basically delineating your regions of rejection, so on, so on and so forth. Um, and I think that that's fairly straightforward to you. Obviously, we haven't continued in that vein. We moved on to using p-values p now that we kind of understand how uh, to actually test uh, sets of data for different hypotheses that we can make. So complementary hypotheses, either a null hypothesis or an alternative hypothesis, and how that relates to a space and a probability distribution. We covered errors and p-values, so the difference between type 1 error, type 2 error, why a type 1 error is important to us, uh, and um, what the relevance of different uh, test statistics are in relation to um, uh, the, the, the hypotheses that we state and either retain or reject. Inferential tests, so the challenge here is always going to be which test should you use for the right situation and I gave you a flow diagram to really kind of help support you in that decision which you may need to make regarding which test to use in your dissertation. So we covered one sample difference of means tests and we covered one sample difference of proportions tests and then we kind of uh, 
progressed into understanding, uh, you know, what, uh, those similar tests, but relative, relative to two different samples. And the issue there, obviously, is that do you have samples which are completely independent from each other, or are they actually matched uh, samples? So did you survey the same participants once and then survey the same participants again, and therefore they're actually linked, and therefore you have to use a slightly different test? And obviously we covered both parametric approaches there and also the non-parametric approaches. Multiple sample tests, so we covered analysis of variance ANOVA for those situations where you've got parametric data and, and that's something which you'll commonly use if you progress further into this area. Uh, whereas uh, the Kruskal Wallace was obviously the non-parametric based approach for this particular uh, uh, um, statistical test. Categories, so we covered that with the chi-squared goodness of fit, Kolmogonov, Shmurinov, goodness of fit and contingency analysis based approaches. Correlation we covered only a couple of weeks ago, so the Pearson correlation uh, and Spearman rank correlation coefficients, and then we kind of brought them forward into the regression assessments that we did this week. Inferential spatial statistics, we covered a range of different uh, tests from nearest neighbor analysis to quadrat analysis, joint count analysis, Moran's eye. And um, just this week, we've covered all those different types of regression, so kind of the more simple approaches by variate. So actually just having two variables or multivariate, where essentially you've got you know maybe three, four, five different types of uh, regression um, explanatory variables that you want to use within your assessment. Okay, great. So I just put that in at the end so that you could have a bit of an overview of basically where we've come from. Uh, hopefully now you've managed to kind of make it to the end of McGrew. Um, so um, that would put you in good stead for completing the final exams. Uh, and do make sure you manage to get some time to revise before them. I, I just need you to apply yourself for a couple more weeks and then, you know, you can do whatever you want to. Summer break, have a big party, go on a holiday, enjoy yourself. So just a couple of last notes. So uh, I hope that this content's been really good for you. You know, as you go off into the world, this content will help you uh, earn a higher salary, it'll improve your job retention, it'll help you make the world a better place. So I, I hope that it's been really useful. Um, please do come say hi to me if you see me around. Uh, you can catch up with me on, uh, you can follow me on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn as well. If any, if anything that I'm doing is of use to you or if you need help uh, regarding kind of career options and stuff, then don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, you can still email me, you've got my emails. Uh, you've got my email address. And the other thing I was going to say is at some point you will receive notification uh, regarding uh, course survey, course feedback for this course. And, you know, I'd really appreciate it if you could fill that out uh, because, you know, for my job, I'm assessed on you guys having a fun time when you're doing this course. Uh, I appreciate this isn't the easiest course and it's very hard, but I hope that I've made it relatively fun and hopefully... Uh, I've minimised the amount of pain as you've gone through the course, okay? Uh, and I've always tried to make it so that you guys have um, had the best opportunity to succeed, whether that's, you know, helping you uh, with uh, the assignments or giving you the most amount of time that I can for you to complete the exams. Um, so, yeah, it'd be really good if you could fill out those course feedback forms, please. I think it's going to be an electronic version. Uh, and then the other thing, if you really want to be kind, it would be great if you could leave some feedback on the professor. So rate my professor because at the moment I'm an unknown quantity. <laughs> and uh, obviously no one knows who I am. They don't want to be stuck with a bad teacher. So it'd be great if you could leave some feedback on there, please, because it means that in the future people actually want to sign up to my courses, which uh, is you know generally a very good thing uh, because until I'm a tenured professor, I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, you know, I'm always going to be reviewed on my performance and that I need to have people signing up to the work that, that I do. So that would be fantastic if you would be able to do that, please. OK, great. Uh, this is the end of the lecture. I'll see you within the laboratory session. And uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you've got any further questions about any of this content. OK, thanks very much for tuning in and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.